Good evening, everyone. A warm welcome to all of you who have joined us. I'm sure there are still lots of people in the process of joining us. And I'm sure this will be a very special tribute to a truly inspirational human being, Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs, who sadly passed away last Shabbat. My name is Peter Wertheim, and I'm the co-CEO of the Executive Council of Australian Jewry. May I acknowledge Jeanette Searle, the CEO of the Zionist Federation of Australia, who you will hear from shortly. Our two organisations are co-hosting this evening's event. May I begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the various lands upon which we are located across Australia and pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging, and a special welcome to any Indigenous people who have joined us tonight. Indeed, at last count, we have more than 550 people attending this event, not only from the Jewish community, but also from the wider community, including our friends in other faith communities. A very warm welcome to all of you. 550 attendees is an extraordinary number, considering that people were given only 48 hours notice of this event and its testament in itself to how widely revered Rabbi Sachs was. A big thank you to Lindsay Benoon from the Executive Council of Australian Jury for putting this event together so quickly and efficiently, and to Jeanette Searle and Emily Gian from the Zionist Federation of Australia for their invaluable cooperation and assistance. Tonight's event is being recorded and the recording will be uploaded to YouTube. Although all of you will be on mute, you may, if you wish, leave your own personal written tribute to Rabbi Sachs by using the chat function. I'm sure all of you by now know what that is and how to use it. Uh, we will save all of these tributes onto a document and send it to Rabbi Sachs' family via my colleague and friend, Gillian Merrin, the CEO of the Board of Deputies of British Jews, who has kindly agreed to do this for us. The invitation you received indicates the names of those who will be presenting tonight, and I'm sure you will hear some wonderful, moving tributes to Rabbi Sachs. You may have also already read the tributes from the Executive Council of Australian Jury and the Zionist Federation of Australia, which were included in the invitation. I will add only four sentences to reflect my own personal tribute, if I may. Rabbi Sachs, as we all know, combined formidable intellectual gifts with exceptional abilities as a writer and communicator. And he devoted himself to bringing the moral and ethical vision of Judaism, not just to his fellow Jews, but to humanity at large. At a time when resurgent religious extremism is causing increased division and conflict in many parts of the world, he tirelessly promoted the message that the diverse religious traditions of humankind should be a unifying force through which people of all backgrounds can confront the challenges of our times in a true spirit of compassion, humility, and mutual respect. He was a great ambassador for the Jewish faith and the Jewish people. And while his untimely passing is a painful loss, we will continue to learn and be enriched by the magnificent legacy he leaves behind him. And on that note, I now invite our first presenter, Rabbi Ralph Ganendi OAM, to address us. Ralph Ganendi is a member of the Executive Council of Australian Jury and senior rabbi to the Australian Defence Forces, also a member of the Victorian Multicultural Advisory Committee of the Premier of Victoria. Rabbi Ganendi. Thank you, Peter. Yetziat Tzadik Minamakom Osaroshem. Our rabbis say to us that when a righteous person, a good person, Tzadik, departs from a place, that place is impoverished. It loses something of its spark. It loses something 
of its grace. And when Rabbi Jonathan Sachs left our world this past Shabbat, it felt darker, it felt smaller, diminished, bereft, for he had brought so much light and enlightenment with his erudite mind, with his sharply brilliant insights, his polished aphorisms, his wit, and his playful humor. My world has been diminished by the loss of my teacher. He wasn't my formal teacher, my rabbi per se, but he was, in a sense, my rebbe. He spoke directly to my heart. He acknowledged that my love of the world, of literature, that world of literature, of music, of psychology, of philosophy, of the arts, and of culture, could all be infused and could all be synthesized with my love of Torah, with my fealty to halacha, and to my passion for Talmud. More than that, he affirmed me, he affirmed for me that Judaism isn't at four, isn't restricted to a small coterie of closed community, but embraces and engages in civil society, in the conversation of humanity, in the empowerment and healing of our fractured world. But most of all, he was a man of compassion and active chesed, a man who acknowledged failure. He walked with royalty, he spoke with nobility, he engaged with humanity. He's a down-to-earth moral philosopher with a deep understanding of human frailty. He knew about the bruising, unforgiving world of politics and especially community politics and broigers. He understood what it was to pick yourself up again and again, to forgive and to forge on. I can't quite imagine a world without Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, without another original insight into a Talmudic dialogue, without another quotable quote on the parasha. I can't begin to imagine the grief of his wife, of Elaine, of his family, of his kids and grandchildren, of his friends and of his students. In speaking to my own son, Yoni, who's studying at Oxford, lamenting, we lamented on our mutual loss. We realized just how much Jonathan Sachs had shaped our own responses to so much of Jewish thought, to contemporary issues, to morality, to the great partnership that we have with science, to the belief we have in our God. Jonathan Sachs, to echo the words that you, to your tribute to Leonard Cohen, thank you for teaching us. Thank you for showing us the light, showing us how to recognize the crack that is in everything that lets that light come in. Thank you for allowing us to appreciate an informed heart, for showing us how to learn and how to live as Jews in an often cold and dark world. You taught us how to let the light come in. You brought a little more hope and kindness, righteousness and redemption into our world. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi Ganendi. I now call upon Jeanette Searle, the CEO of the Zionist Federation of Australia, to address us. Thank you. We are indeed fortunate to have Rabbi Sachs' insights and words as a lasting legacy. In his 2009 book, Future Tense, he wrote movingly about his relationship with the State of Israel. And I'd like to share selected excerpts from it with you this evening because nobody can say it more eloquently or inspire us more deeply than Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs, Zichron Olivracha. So in his words, he says, I have tried to say what Israel means to me and why I have consistently defended it, sometimes to a hostile British public. No nation is perfect, none can avoid mistakes. Criticism of Israel is legitimate, denial of its right to exist is not. My attachment to it is not political but religious. Israel is the land where Judaism was born, almost four millennia ago, when Abraham and Sarah began their journey. 
Judaism gave rise in turn to Christianity and Islam, both of which literally or metaphorically claim descent from Abraham and Sarah. Today, there are 120 countries in which the majority of the population is Christian. There are 57 member states of the Organization of the Islamic Conference. There is only one Jewish state, a tiny country, one quarter of 1% of the landmass of the Arab world. Israel has done extraordinary things. It has absorbed immigrants from 103 countries speaking 82 languages. It has turned a desolate landscape into a place of forests and fields. It has developed cutting edge agricultural and medical techniques and created one of the world's most advanced high-tech economies. It has produced great poets and novelists, artists and sculptors, symphony orchestras, universities and research institutes. It has presided over the rebirth of the great Talmudic academies destroyed in Eastern Europe during the Holocaust. Wherever in the world there is a humanitarian disaster, Israel, if permitted, is one of the first to send aid. It has shared its technologies with other developing countries. Under immense strain, it has sustained democracy, a free press, and an independent, some say too independent, judiciary. Had my grandfather been able to see what it has achieved, he would hardly believe it. In truth, I hardly believe it when I read Jewish history and begin to understand what Jewish life was like when there was no Israel. For me, more than anything else, Israel is a living testimony to the power of Moses' command to choose life. And he continues, and a day will come when the story of Israel in modern times will speak not just to Jews, but to all who believe in the power of the human spirit as it reaches out to God, as an everlasting symbol of the victory of life over death, hope over despair. Israel has taken a barren land and made it bloom again. It has taken an ancient language, the Hebrew of the Bible, and made it speak again. It has taken the West's oldest faith and made it young again. It, is, it, it has taken a shattered nation and made it live again. Yehi Zichro Baruch. Um, I would now like to call upon Rabbanit Judith Levitan to recite Psalm 23 in Hebrew and Jackie Seaman to do the tra English translation. Mizmor le David, Adonai roi lo echsar, binodeshet yarbetseni almei menuchot yenahaleni, nafshi yeshovev, Yancheni b'magle tzedek l'man shemo. Gam ki elech b'gei tzalmavet. Lo irara ki ata imadi. Shiftecha umishantecha heima yenachamuni. Ta'aroch lefanai shulchan neged zorarai. Dishanta v'shemen roshi kosi revaya. Achtov v'chesed yirdefuni kol yemei chayai. Beshafti beveit Adonai le orech yamim. This translation comes from the Koran Sidur, Koran being the publishing house, as many will know, that Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs made such an immense contribution to, both in terms of translation and commentary and guiding us through the magnificence of Jewish prayer and Jewish thought. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You set a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup is filled to overflowing. May goodness and kindness follow me all the days of my life. And may I live in the house of the Lord forevermore. Thank you, Jackie. We now have two further tributes. Firstly, Rabbi Benjamin Elton, Chief Rabbi at the Great Synagogue, Sydney. Oh. And he'll be followed by Rabbi Jeffrey Cammons, Senior Rabbi at Emmanuel Synagogue, Wallara. Both of them are advisors to the Executive Council of Australian Jury. 
Rabbi Elbin. I'm very honored to uh, say these few words in memory and tribute to Emeritus, Lord, uh, Emeritus Chief Rabbi Lord Sachs, as the Quran Libracha, Rabbi Yaakov Svi Ben David Arya. I want to look at three themes in these uh, short minutes, moving from the universal to the particular, just as Rabbi Sachs moved and lived between the universal and the particular. First, he was an unparalleled Oral Agoyim. There was never anybody in modern Jewish history who was a Jewish light to the nations like Rabbi Sachs became. I remember when I was 10 years old and he was the wreath lecturer, he delivered the most distinguished set of lectures in a British society broadcast by the BBC. And I tuned in to listen and didn't understand very much, but I was filled with immense pride that a Jew, a religious Jew, a rabbi had been called upon to deliver these lectures to the entire nation. He made many subsequent broadcasts on British television and was acknowledged by many non-Jews as well as Jews as their spiritual leader. He wrote books, important books, speaking to both a Jewish and a general audience. And I remember again with pride bringing home a signed copy of one of his latest books and placed it in the library of my non-Jewish school because he was a rabbi who could speak to the entire world in a compelling way. And then towards the end of his career and his life, he was a member of the House of Lords and there he spoke up in defense of Israel and against anti-Semitism. Secondly, he was an oral Yehudim. He was a light to the Jews. He was first and foremost a rabbi for his own community. He was reliably exceptional. Whenever he stood up to deliver a sermon or a keynote address or a special lecture, you knew you were going to hear something absolutely extraordinary. I used to go to the synagogue in London for Yom Kippur, where he would be in residence and he would give the sermon before Neila and the entire crowd of over a thousand people was always simply electrified by what he had to say. Again, towards the end of his career, he turned his attention towards the Siddur and the prayer books for the uh, high holidays and the three pilgrim festivals and the Haggadah and filled those with insights which so elevate our experience of prayer every day and on special occasions. He sent out his covenant and conversation emails all around the world every week of his insights into the Torah portion. And it's a tragedy that his Kumash, his uh, translation and commentary on the five books of Moses, which was to be his next great project, uh, will never reach fruition. We can only hope that at least some of the books have already been prepared and can be released for publication after editing. And thirdly and finally, he was for me the supreme ideologue of inclusive orthodoxy. The United Synagogue, which he led as the spiritual leader, had sometimes been regarded as a matter of compromise, how to maintain a, a centrist and inclusive position in order to maintain a certain level of uh, popular support. But what Rabbi Sachs showed was this wasn't a matter of expediency or compromise. It was derived from deep principle, the idea of Knesset Yisrael, the idea that all Jews are one people, and the purpose of religious leadership is to enable as many people as possible to be part of the religious community. That the bar should not be set so high that we turn people away, but rather we should do everything we can within the confines of halacha and our basic beliefs to, to welcome them in and to draw them into relationship with each other and with God. He was the supreme um, thinker behind an orthodoxy that was both authentic and welcoming. And that, I know, is the guide for many of us who run and lead the centrist Orthodox synagogues here in Sydney. Rabbi Sachs was, in every sense, a once-in-a-century figure. And he was taken too soon. The age of 72 is far too young, especially these days. But even without the extra 20 years we were all hoping for and expecting and longing for, we know he has left us so much that will guide and inspire us over the coming years, and will keep his memory fresh and holy. He is a Baruch. May his memory be a blessing. And, uh, I'm honored to be here this evening, but I have to say that I actually am speaking on behalf of my colleague, Rabbi Jacqueline Nino, who was asked to speak tonight, but unfortunately uh, for us uh, is at a chupa. And so in that moment of celebration where she is at, she has uh, written these words, which I have to say, 
they're in her style, but it absolutely reflects uh, not just what I think, but I think what uh, all the uh, rabbis uh, of whom, with whom we work uh, think as well. Rabbi Nino's words. Unlike some of the others speaking today, I'd not have the privilege of meeting Rabbi Jonathan Sachs in person. Instead, I met him through his books, his articles, his speeches, his teachings. For years before every Shabbat, my ritual is to open Rabbi Sachs' covenant in conversation and read his words about the Parsha. Through the many years of reading, so many of his teachings have been profound. His stories have remained long after I've finished reading the words, but there is one story he has told in many different forms and occasions. It is about his first encounter with the Lubavitcher Rebbe, a man who changed the course of Rabbi Sachs' life and to whom he turned on more than one occasion for guidance and support. Rabbi Lord Sachs wrote of his meeting. One of the most humble people I ever met was the late Lubavitcher Rebbe, Rabbi Menachem Mendel Schneerson. There was nothing self-abasing about him. He carried himself with quiet dignity. He was self-confident and had an almost regal bearing. But when you were alone with him, he made you feel you were the most important person in the room. It was an extraordinary gift. It was royalty without a crown. It was greatness in plain clothes. It taught me that humility is not thinking that you are small. It is thinking that other people have greatness within them. And that was Rabbi Six, Sachs' gift to us all, continues Rabbi Ninia. He found greatness in all of us. He made each of us feel we were the most important person in the room. When he wrote, you felt he was speaking to you. His stories were told for you. His guidance and teaching was there to open worlds for you. Whether you were a prince or a queen, a scholar or a layperson, a Jew of another faith or no faith at all, whether you were part of his community or a progressive or Masorti rabbi in Sydney a world away, Rabbi Sachs had the remarkable gift to speak to each person, to help each one of us to feel as if we were the only one in the room, that his message was for us. He was able to uncover worlds, to engage us with difficult concepts and principles, to guide us to know and understand the deepest teachings of our tradition. He had such a love of Judaism, its texts and its wisdom, and he enfolded us in that love. He wrapped us in the warmth and beauty of tradition and wove into the cloth teachings from secular philosophy, popular culture, and he inspired us. He saw the greatness in us. Rabbi Sachs said of the Rebbe that he could see others and see what they could become. Rabbi Sachs saw what we all could become. He constantly challenged us and all people to live by the values we hold dear, to change the world, to heal what is broken, to be a force for good and hope, to change the world. He, his was a living Judaism, one which sought to bring to life the dreams of tomorrow. His moral compass guided us. Last year, in Convent, Con Covenant and Conversation, he wrote about this week's parasha, Chaye Sara, the life of Sara. There he noted the paradox that a portion called the life of Sarah speaks about her death and also that of Abraham. Rabbi Sachs teaches that it is to help us to see that to understand a death, we have to understand a life. Today we gather at the time of his death to understand even more a life of great honor. The life of a person who was a luminary, a light in our world, a true blessing, and whose life, writings, and teachings will continue to be an inspiration as he now lives through each one of us whose lives he has touched as we continue to learn and teach in the name of our teacher, Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs. Zichron Olivracha, may his memory. Be a blessing. Thank you to both rabbis for those uh, lovely words. And we will now hand over to Chazan Mordechai Levin, who will recite the El Malay Rahamin. Shochen mamro mim, a 
for that beautiful rendition. So that brings us to the conclusion of the formal part of the proceedings, ladies and gentlemen. We will keep the session going for another two minutes to allow those of you who would like to leave a written tribute to Rabbi Sachs to do so. And as I mentioned at the outset, we will collect all of the uh, tributes in one document. We will send it to Rabbi Sachs's family via our colleagues at the British Board of Deputies. And so if you do have any last minute uh, thoughts or wishes that you would like to convey, um, we'll give you that last opportunity. Otherwise, I thank everybody for participating tonight. We did it at a very short notice, uh, but we are indebted to a wonderful team of people, both at the Executive Council of Australian Jury and the Zionist Federation. And again, I thank Lindsay Benoon Ned Searle and Emily Gian for all their hard work in putting this together. And I thank in particular all of our contributors, uh, all the Robinim, uh, Robinette Judith Levitan and Jackie Seaman, and of course, Hazan Mordechai Levin. So that really brings us to the conclusion. And I wish everyone a good evening. No doubt there'll be much more said and written about uh, Lord Jonathan Sachs everywhere because really, uh, his reach was everywhere, and that's much to the benefit of all of us. Thank you and good night. <laughs>